define the celibacy for this place? <clears throat> Sir, I can only give you my opinion, mm -hmm. which is not a, it's shared by others. Celibacy uh, enables, there are a lot of spiritual excuses surrounding celibacy, that if you're celibate, for example, you are totally dedicated to the ministry, uh, you have no distracting issues such as your wife and your children. Um, I was a military chaplain for many, many years, and I rubbed shoulders all the time with married Protestant chaplains. I never met one that I thought uh, was in any manner, way, shape, or form less dedicated, less unselfish. In fact, most of them were more unselfish than I could ever dream of being. So that argument falls flat, I think. Um, the, the justification... Uh, is generally given in spiritual terms, and it's all based on the teaching of human sexuality, that if you don't have sex, you're a better person, a higher person than those that do. Virginity is a higher calling. Um, that doesn't say much about all the people who aren't that are married, uh, but that's the official, the official teaching. Um, so you go on with that, and then... Uh, uh, that's, those are some of the defenses, but there's another layer that is not openly discussed, and that's the fact that the celibacy issue creates a power uh, link between the superiors and the priests, a controlling link uh, that you have there. It also uh, creates a mystique about the priests, as I mentioned earlier, that, that we have some sort of extra power, something about us because we're able to live in a celibate life, we're set apart, we're over there. Um, the, so those are, those are some of the, the issues that, that come that surround it. Now, historically, uh, one of the reasons that celibacy uh, was, option, was, was a, was a um, positive issue was because when the priests, the married priests died, their property would go to their oldest son. So money talks. And if you eliminate the possibility of an, of an oldest son, it will divert to the, to the church. Uh, there's a lot of historical uh, evidence that verifies that. Going beyond the contradiction and um, back to the integrity issue, Dr. Doyle, um, the celibacy is a vow, is it not? Uh, <clears throat> celibacy for diocesan priests is a promise uh, that there's a technical difference in canon law. But essentially, the end result is the same. A, pre, a diocesan priest assumes mandatory celibacy when he's ordained a deacon. Uh, Are you familiar with the broken windows concept? I'm not, I'm sorry. I probably should be if you mentioned it. But. Well, it, it, it's an American concept and... Uh, Mayor Giuliano uh, gives himself credit for it, but it's the idea that if there's a broken window in a district and you don't repair it, it allows for further broken windows and results in a general breakdown of order and so on. So he said basically to his police force, attend to the broken windows and that will help attend to other things. And the point of that analogy is this, that uh, surely if by virtue of human nature, if priests are unable to contain themselves within the celibacy promise, then breaking that particular promise can induce a lack of observance of other promises. I think you're correct in that. And therefore, that lack of integrity can extend to such things as child sexual abuse or the institutional response to reports of child sexual abuse. In other words, it diminishes all vows. Uh, I would, I think you've phrased that in a way I wish I could, but uh, yes, I would agree with that, that it does diminish. Um, I believe the men who are sexually abusing, abusing children that are suffering from a psychosexual disorder are under... Uh, a tremendous burden of compulsion. This much I do know from some of my training. Uh, they don't even think about vows or promises when they're compelled to act out. And many of them feel a, a tremendous amount of grief, um, guilt and shame after they've acted out. It's much like an alcoholic who's still an alcoholic, a practicing alcoholic, doesn't want to, he wants to stop drinking. And of this I know what I'm talking about. He wants to stop desperately. 
But when the situation is there, you, you cannot, the compulsion to drink is too great and you cannot stop. And so you do until something radical happens and there's a complete rebuilding of you, of your person from the inside out into sobriety. With this, uh, in many instances, with the men who suffer from a serious psychosexual disorder, there's the compulsive level. Uh, I heard it described at a, a lecture I was taken to by a psychiatrist in Baltimore as, the, he's talking about pedophiles. He said the pedophile, the level of compulsion that he has to act out sexually now, by pedophile, I mean the prepubescent children, not adolescents. The level of compulsion is approximately 40 times more than the level of compulsion of a healthy male at the peak of his sexuality. Uh, and that somewhat explains a little bit of the, the incredible compulsion of that particular subgenre of this. I guess I'm going towards a another nuance if I can and that is that for someone who's broken the vow of, or the promise of celibacy when they hear of another pr priest breaking the vow that affects his attitudes or his relationships with children a sexual with the children says to themselves who am I to condemn that person because I've broken vows myself now I don't know if that's part of the priestly mentality, but what's extraordinary about child sexual abuse within the church is a lack of people coming forward to report it. And I've wondered if that's because they have taken the view that we're all sinners. We've broken this vow, you've broken that vow well, you know. I, I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, I. I uh, do know of the fact that very, very few priests who have known about this happening in the, their living circumstances have reported it. Sometimes in the past I know of instances where they have reported it, and this factor that you brought up, that I've never, that's never come across my, my screen, so to speak. Ordinarily, the reason for failure to report is I don't want to get involved, or uh, I know this guy, I don't want to get him in trouble. Um, or uh, something of that nature uh, where, they, where they will. I mean, I've seen cases where priests have actually walked in on other priests engaging in sex with young boys or young girls and walked out the door and said nothing. So it's more, uh, I think, uh, but the question you ask is a very good question. Why have not more men come forward? Part of that has to do with the fact that some of those who have have been told by the bishop keep your mouth shut, mind your own business, go back. Uh, there in the 80s when all of this came out, there were some priests that I knew of who preached about it from the pulpit, uh, about the fact that we need to do something about this seriously. And they were told to stand down, not to preach about it. Uh, so that's that level there that did not want that becoming publicly known for the protection of the institution. Um, those priests who have publicly stood up and stood with victims and criticized uh, or spoken out, everyone has been penalized in one way or another. Uh, every bishop who has stood up and stood with victims publicly, and there are only three that I know of out of 4,400, uh, has been in some way or other penalized or, or isolated or sidelined. Um, everyone by the Holy See. Uh, because they have gone public with an issue that the system would pr would still prefer to keep unknown and buried in secrecy. Doctor, you referred earlier to there being a misunderstanding of what the church really is. Perhaps you could just explain that a bit further. Yes, I will. I'd be happy to. Oftentimes we hear the phrase, we must don't do this, don't report it for the good of the church. Or the policeman who arrests the priest said, I'm going to turn him, take him back to the rectory for the good of the church. Or victims are told, don't say anything about this for the good of the church. 
or the excuse that we've kept it under, we've hidden it, we've shuffled men around for the good of the church. Who is the church? That is heresy, because the church, according to the official teaching of the Second Vatican Council, is the people of God, all of the people of God, including the victims and their mothers and fathers, including the people who have walked out the door and left. They are officially the people of God. The structure, which is oftentimes the church in the minds of way too many people, is part of that. That gives structure to the people of God. But that is not the be-all and the end-all of the concept of the church. And I have learned over the years of dealing with this that, unfortunately, the belief that we are the church, namely we who are in the governmental structure, we who are part of the system are the church, uh, is not true. It's simply not true. And But that belief, if you believe that deeply, first off, for many of these men, that belief guarantees their past, their present, and their future, their whole life. Second, that belief justifies protecting the church, even though we, we hate to have to do this, we don't want to sacrifice uh, these victims and so on, but we must protect the church at all costs. And that essentially is what is the, the justification, the concept that this structure, this, this institution, this governing structure, and the men in it are... They are the church, and that they must be protected at all costs. One thing I didn't mention earlier, and I can briefly say that the Catholic Church revolves around the sacraments, the seven ceremonies that are connected with various important parts of your life, communion, baptism, confirmation, and our way to salvation uh, to the door to the other side is through the sacraments. The sacraments are controlled by the clergy, the average layperson has a passive dependent relationship with the priests because the priest decides if you're going to get married or not. He gives you communion. Here, here's your confession. He does your confirmation or the bishop does, etc. So the sacraments, which are part of the institution, they're the visible symbols of the, 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 the insurance policy that you have, so to speak. And that's protected by the clerical culture and by the institutional church. So that does take on a tremendous amount of importance, whereby I think it, it renders it possible to not even see the concept of church as people of God, as this wide group out there, and not even consider these children or these young adults or these older adults from abuse years ago as as important a person in the church as the pope or the cardinals. Now, that is the doctrine. Everybody's equal in the eyes of God. Not down here, but up there they are. Uh, doctor, from your experience and knowledge, are there any suggestions you might make to the Royal Commission as to what changes might be made to affect for the better the institutional response going forward? Uh, yes. I wouldn't have come over here, I think, if I couldn't offer some suggestions. Um, thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to say I'm very honored to be here because I believe what you are doing is unique in the world. It's historic. Uh, it's going to make a mammoth difference in the long run. I mean, you've taken something on that is mind-boggling, and you're going into it in a deeper You've gone into it in a deeper, more uh, enlightened, more courageous manner than any other body that I've had contact with, and I've had contact with a lot of them that are doing analogously the same thing. Uh, this problem, the sexual abuse, the way we've described it, the way you're seeing it, is not unique to Australia. It's worldwide. And what you do and what you say and what you come up with at the end is going to have an effect around the world and it's hopefully going to have a profound effect in the Vatican, and it's another pile of information that is saying what they do not want to hear. But this issue is damaging 
the most vulnerable people in the church, and I believe the community, you are the people of God, have an obligation to say to the system, to the institution, this is what we found. You need to make some changes to make sure this doesn't keep happening. And those changes are structural. Now, I'm not so naive to think that the monarchy is going to fall. There's never been a monarchy that we know of that's voluntarily given up its system in favor of democracy. But that's what you're dealing with. So somehow or other, to make it clear that the, the, the primary importance, primary concern, has to be the victim's of sexual abuse or any other kind of abuse that happens at the hands of the clergy and that the clergy come from the Pope on down, we're all on the same level. It's an equal playing field in the eyes of God. And so we got to take care of each other in the same way. And I think uh, um, that what you are doing here, uh, if you, one of the biggest holes, as I mentioned earlier, has been the lack of pastoral care for victims. Now, the church, the broader church, takes care of the victims. There's men and women, religious women, that are reaching out, that are helping the victims. There were two gentlemen out there said that they're here to be aides for the victims. But the official system has not sent down a decree from on high on offering pastoral care and how to do it, and asking the questions, what kind of pastoral care do they need? And that's simply, for me, it's just been listening, letting them cry, be angry, yell, scream, whatever get it off and try to help the people understand that, you know, you aren't guilty of anything, but there's a whole bag there. But that is more important than all the protocols, all the, the structures, all the, the, the policies, all the paperwork, all the, infant, you know, the, the talk, talk, talk that's been going on. The action is what is needed. Victims are sick and tired of apologies, of explanations, of more promises, of more protocols, of more policies. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. They want something to happen so that if they make a complaint, why isn't it okay for the bishop to say, I'm getting in my car and going over to her house and sit with her family and listen to what happened? That's pretty important. And I think that to me is, is the essence of the whole thing. So if you have... If you, you want to recommend one thing, it's that there be, has to be a primary concern on the care of the present victims, the ones who are there. The, 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 those whose souls have either been damaged beyond repair or who are seriously suffering. Dr. Doyle, you said earlier in your evidence, sorry, uh, that... that um, there was a, a, an, an inability to comprehend the damage. Did you want to just elaborate a bit more about why there is this inability to comprehend the, the, the damage that clearly you've been able to understand as you've worked? Well, I, when I first became involved in this, I didn't have a full idea. I knew, <laughs> just as a normal person, that if, a, if an adult male engages in some form of sex with a, with a, a, a child or uh, an adolescent using force, that that's going to be damaging. I didn't know what it was. But I think the, as we've gone on, the whole concept of human sexuality, uh, where it's, it's put uh, traditionally in the Catholic Church in the realm of morals, it's something the will controls. It's a sin. You get absolution from the sin. If you are the victim, uh, you put it behind you and move on. Uh, the, the inability, I think, to understand some of those uh, non-concrete realities of, of what happens when you're violated sexually. And that stems, I think, from the inability or the lack of awareness as to what human sexuality really is. Uh, when you have the Vatican saying that homosexuality, homosexual men or women are intrinsically disordered, uh, that says volumes. That says we don't really know what we're talking about when you say that about any human being, uh, that, they're sec that they're internally disordered. Um, so I think that's the best answer I can give you. I think it's a misunderstanding of human sexuality. Um, it's a general... Uh, sometimes an unwillingness to really want to learn how bad this is because if we learn how bad this is it's not going to make us look very good in the long run so we'd rather you know look the other way i've heard ad nauseum people say they told me to get over it put it behind me and move on 
And as we say in AA, uh, you don't expect a man who's had his legs cut off for them to grow back. And you don't expect a person who's been violated that way to ever go back to the complete way they were before. Thank you. Dr. Doyle, I have nothing further. Mr. Gray? No, I have no questions, Your Honor. No questions. Dr. Doyle? Cannot be excused, cannot unfortunately, be excused. for Dr. Doyle. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Doyle will be joining us later. I want you to stay, Dr. Doyle. I'll be glad to, I just want to make sure that my gratitude on behalf of my colleagues and the people I, I represent in the states unofficially is heard by you how grateful we are for what you are doing for us but especially what you're doing for those who have been violated who will never come forward uh, never come forward but know that somebody cares enough about them to go through all of this that's important thank, thank you, you for Dr. Doyle, and we very much appreciate it. We can't be excused, but what do I do with it? <laughs> Dr. Doyle, you may leave the witness. <laughs> uh, Thank you. I don't want to go out in the rain, so I'll stay in here. Um, do stay. Do stay. Uh, there's a panel to be convened. It'll take a little amount of time. Perhaps we might take an early lunch in adjournment. All right, we'll take lunch now and we'll come back at 1.30. 1.30. Yes, we'll